Okay, so welcome everybody to All Things Vocal, the blog, the podcast, and today we're going to be video as well. So we'll have a video version uh, too. And I am thrilled to have for today's episode, uh, and my, as my guest, uh, a master teacher in the Alexander Technique. So before we get started, let me tell you who Peter Jacobson is. He is the founder and executive director of Total Vocal Freedom, the world's largest online Alexander Technique learning community. That's pretty cool. He is a singer himself. I love learning from teachers who actually sing. Multi-instrumentalist, a composer, an arranger, conductor, music educator, and an AMSAT certified, which is AMSAT means American Society of the Alexander Technique, a teacher of what we colloquially know as AT. Uh, he discovered the Alexander Technique over 13 years ago after suffering from his own back pain and tendinitis while pursuing his music studies. Um, he's earned advanced degrees in conducting from the University of Illinois, the Peabody Institute of the John Hopkins University, and Peter is a certified transformative coach, which is Michael Neal's uh, Super Coach Academy Europe, a class of 2019. So he is not only good at what he does, but he is, like me, is ever exploring more ways to teach effectively. Uh, so Peter, welcome to All Things Vocal. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Judy, for having me. It's uh, my pleasure to be with you today. Well, uh, let's start out with that definition of that, which is odd because Alexander Technique uh, can be defined in different ways. Uh, it, it encompasses a lot. So I've been interested in, like I say, for a long time and I've actually double teamed students that were particularly tight with uh, someone who, uh, who was an Alexander Technique teacher here named Ethan Kind. And he taught me things like, instead of manually moving people, <laughs> suggest that they move themselves. And that's been huge and things like that. So uh, I, I know about him and I know about Ron Murdoch and have really enjoyed uh, some things that uh, I found online I can't find anymore. He had an incredible uh, anatomy diagram that I used to use a lot with showing people how holding themselves up suspends the diaphragm and the, the larynx. So anyway, uh, but you have your own, from, from taking your course, your 15 hour course called the Foundations in, uh, what is it called? Total Vocal Freedom Foundations, right? I noticed that you have your own unique way of defining Alexander Technique. So let me, let me have you speak to that. I would love to. Um, like you mentioned, I've been interested in this work for many, many years. And in particular, I, I discovered it for my music making. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been interested in how to integrate this work into making music. Um, when I was, I'll tell you a little story. When I was doing my uh, Alexander training at the end, I had to do an independent study project. And my topic was defining the Alexander technique. <laughs> And uh, looking back on it, it was kind of a, um, I don't know, an exercise in frustration because I would open one door and find another, you know, one definition and then another one to present itself. And I eventually realized that every teacher has their own approach and their own definition of this work. And, and so I like to think that in a way that we all sort of um, teach our own version of, of Alexander's discoveries. And I use that that terminology very particularly because we're, we're dealing not so much with a technique um, in, like we would think of a vocal technique. I like to think of more of um, principles and discoveries. And in fact, Alexander didn't even want to call it the Alexander technique. He just called it the work. Um, wow. And it was, it was named the Alexander technique, I believe after his death. So, um, you know, we call it the TVF Alexander work. There's a lot of different ways to, to name it, but our particular approach is we're very interested in taking what Alexander discovered, um, among other things, we draw from other sources too, and applying them directly to the activity of singing because the students we work with, that's what they really care about. How can I be more free in my body? How can I sing better? And so that's what we kind of specialize uh, in doing. And we do that in a variety of different ways. Um, as you mentioned, we have an online school 
Um, we do live workshops. We just um, finished a, a week long retreat in Wisconsin with 50 singers. And it's, uh, it's just a, a delight. And I think um, Alexander's discoveries and singing or using your voice are the perfect match because Alexander himself had a passion to use his voice, but he also had a problem using his voice. Right. And he would lose his voice. Mm -hmm. And so the discoveries that he made about the voice and how it's connected to our whole system, I think are, tr are truly groundbreaking. And it's fascinating to me that this works over a hundred years old and it's been around for a long time. Um, in the music world, it's, it's quite well known in the general public, especially in the United States, um, more so. Um, well, in the UK, it's quite known, but here in the States, it's not not mm -hmm. so known, um, but I just believe this work can benefit everybody. Yeah, I truly do too. I truly do too. Uh, so let's, uh, let's talk about your teaching method that sort of the three-part formula for artistry. What's yeah. odd is I, I came upon, uh, when uh, I began teaching 20 years ago, like a triad of, of techniques that are synergistic and they have to do with the breath, the open throat, and Factors of communication, which, oh my gosh, we is so parallel to some of the things you talk about with intention. But anyway, to back to your three three way kind of uh, formula for artistry. Uh, let's talk about that uh, that that triad: desire, coordination, and technique. Yes, I'm so glad you bring this up because this is one of the first things that I want to communicate to people about this work in terms of creating the context where it sits in a person's training and how they can use it. Mm -hmm. the, like I said, the word technique is very confusing to people because I've had people, you know, on these um, uh, social media forums and things like that say, Alexander technique is not a vocal technique. It's like, no, it's not. We don't claim to be a vocal technique, but so the technique is a very confusing word. Um, so I think it's good to, to identify where does the work situate and how does it, um, what is the relationship between what we do and a vocal technique? So I've come up with this, what I call the three-part formula for artistic excellence. And I think it really kind of covers the main three things that um, any performing artist deals with. Mm -hmm. So like you said, it's desire plus coordination plus technique. And the, the best way I can describe this, and I think in a way that modern people can understand, is a computer. Mm -hmm. So a computer basically needs three things. It needs a power source, it needs hardware, and it needs software. Yeah. Now, in, in, in vocal technique, we're dealing a lot with the software. And, and I would also include in technique our musicianship and our ability to, the, the skills we have as performers, standing in front of an audience and communicating. Mm -hmm. Although the, I'm more and more seeing that, that that ties to the first one, which is our desire to communicate something. Right. And, and Alexander, you know, a lot of people say, well, the story of Alexander is a man who had a problem. I disagree, actually. I think it's a story of a man with a passion and a, des a deep desire. And if you read his story, one of the first lines he says, from childhood on, I had this deep desire um, and deep love of Shakespeare. And that was, that was what he wanted to do. That's what drove him. He didn't care so much to solve his problem. He cared more so to solve his problem so he could do his passion, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's the, the power source. What's driving you? What is your desire? What is your intention to communicate musical mm -hmm. thoughts and ideas mm -hmm. to a listener? That's essential. And, right. and that, in my musical training, I don't know about you, Judy, but that was often not even discussed. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Listen, part of my, <laughs> my job security is people coming in here, not knowing what they're supposed to be doing with this, literally not knowing what it's for. They think it's for winning a Grammy or getting a record deal or getting applause. And, and it's when I focus them into, no, it's actually for delivering a message to a specific heart that gets a specific response. And then everything changes. It's acting technique. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if you think about it, it's what we do all day long. If we're having a conversation, I'm trying to communicate something to, to you, you're communicating to me. We just do this naturally as human beings. But then somehow when we go to make music, we just lose sight of the naturalness we have during our, our everyday lives. 
Right. So, so that's kind of the first piece is the desire. And so the first, the first thing I'm always coming back to with students is what, what are you trying to do? What's your desire? What do you want from this? And that is what's driving everything. We, we say in TVF, desire drives excellence. Mm -hmm. you know, without desire, you're not going to go, go really anywhere. So, or you're going to go somewhere and it's going to be for the wrong reasons and you're going to become really self-conscious and then you're going to become really tight. <laughs> right, right. And when the desire is just to be perfect, that yeah. is an absolute, absolute saboteur. <clears throat> That's a sabotaging thought. Yeah. And I love, I want to get to that with some of the rest of these questions, but I love the way you set that free. Um, so let's go to talking about, I get lots of desperate questions on all things vocal and in my office about singers and speakers begging for instant help to overcome uh, like laryngitis for an upcoming performance like that night or that weekend. And okay. so that's, uh, I find that the first thing that I have to help them do is stop being afraid and, and, and like go, what, what would happen to you if you canceled? Um, would you die? You know, and stuff like that and allow themselves uh, the, the freedom to relax and open up and get them trusting me. So uh, then they, then they, then they can relax their frozen mental and physical conditions and let, let flexibility begin the process of getting their voices back. And instead of fear-based desperation, please explain your approach uh, to noticing, exploring, and experimenting without passing judgment. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, this is such a juicy topic. <laughs> um, there was a word that you used in there and I want to um, hook into that because I think it was so great. And the word was freedom. And w there's a fundamental idea in Alexander's work, which we call freedom of choice. Yeah. And this is a gift that a lot of people do not ever give themselves. And, and like you said, it's that moment where I can choose to do this or not to do this. I am free to choose. And in a way you're giving yourself the freedom to do what you want to do. Even like if you're about to go on stage asking the question, do I deeply want to do this? And, get, and just when one of my teachers said, when no is an option, yes means a whole lot more. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> and so it's like, oh, I could absolutely walk off stage and not do this performance. And there would be consequences. I might not get paid. I might not get asked back. But still, I have that choice within me. So that's one of the, the fundamental places that we start with. And that I think that connects to our desire, that we have a, a deep desire to do this. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting you said about someone that comes to you with uh, laryngitis or they have issues with their voice and they're looking for maybe a, a quick fix or something. Um, and I love what you said about giving them hope. I also think Alexander's story is very instructive because that was, that's what was happening to him. And what happened was he went to a doctor and, and the doctor said, well, why don't you take a couple of weeks off for your next big gig? So he did. And about halfway through the performance, he, he lost his voice and he went back to the doctor and he said, well, doc, I did what you said. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> and uh, then he said, you know, can you tell me what's going on? And Doc said, I can't. And Alexander said, well, I am going to figure this out myself. And then he went and for several years, he just did all of these experiments on himself. And he discovered he was doing these things to himself, to his body, to his system that were not helpful and were actually the cause of, but this took many years. And when people come to me for a quick fix, I don't really deal in quick fixes. Now, students, they may have an immediate result, but learning this work for me is a lifelong process. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I want to plant these seeds of, you know, like you said, exp experimentation, curiosity, exploration. These are what lead us to what we truly want. And sometimes uh, when we make a mistake, that's even more instructive than when we get it perfect, because maybe we don't know how to do it on purpose uh, to do it better. And so the mistake, when we become observant with it and not don't judge it, don't beat it up, it's like, thank you for showing me that. <laughs> we can actually thank our mistakes. Yes. Uh, so it's weird. And what I find is, yeah, there can be instant fixes. Uh, I do, you know, do it every, every lesson by just changing somebody's posture, changing where they, they feel like they're coming from, where their power center is. 
uh, changing uh, what they're thinking that they're doing, changing their desire and stuff like that. And what's cool is they are instant fixes, but what that, what I ask them then, uh, the, my next question for them is usually, okay, are you curious now? And then I can teach them things that they can practice because they may not, the, the, I think a frustration is that they may go home and not be able to repeat that. So I need to give them something to, to think about or something to practice so they can kind of embody that and, and discover it for themselves inside. So it is a process. So it's both instant and it's lifelong, like you're saying. Yeah. It's and, and lifelong. Yeah. And, and what I would, our, the way that we describe this, you know, that I talked about that middle piece of uh, coordination, desire coordination technique. Uh -huh. um, the coordination is really what you might call cooperating with our design. Mm -hmm. So when people when people cooperate with their design often like you said it's instant if they have a habit of pushing back on themselves and i show them actually will you balance in your center and instantly their sound will change but but like you said i want to point them towards the thinking and the process which got them there not just do this do that it's we're looking for what is the most natural thing in our body and how does our our system work and cooperating with that and that's what leads us to the freedom we're looking for right right and just to just a little uh information for you on me the reason i know the things that i do or I've learned the things that i have vocally partly is because i lost an octave and a half of my range uh due to an endotracheal tube in three months in the hospital when my son was born so I had to either, it's like either stop singing or dig in. And I didn't have the money to actually go and get professional help. So what I did was I dug into and I, I brought out my classical songs of, of all things and that I'd learned for one year in college. I'd learned some classical, uh, you know, uh, the 20, 21 uh, Italian songs. I'd learned a few of them. And I started experimenting in my head voice. And I started like, I had to just observe. And, and then I finally, two years later, I physically healed and was on my way vocally, but I, we moved from Memphis to Nashville and I got thrust right in the middle of incredibly competitive uh, uh, studio work because I was doing background session, session work back in the days when every, every record had that. So what happened was I had to get her done. And so tension was like crazy. It's just trying to like crazy to make my voice do the right thing, you know, so nobody would know that I, my voice was sick had, or had been sick. So I went to the uh, greatest professional coach here, Gerald Arthur, who has passed away. But the first thing he told me was, you've got to stop guarding. And so that, you know, to me, what you do and it helps me with my students to do to do it better is help people let go of making it right and start experimenting in that 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 uh, deep another thing about about your way of training is <laughs> i found it slow you made me slow down and i'm that not by nature i'm a bumblebee uh Yoga, oh my God, I never wanted to do yoga until somebody sort of made me do it because uh, I needed to build some bone. And I found out it's a lot harder in the first place that, than you'd think to get slow. Okay. But it's, you have to get slow to be able to observe what's going on. Yes. So thank you for that. <laughs> <You're> welcome. <laughs> uh, all right, let's talk about, I find that students actually after I, change something instantly and help them instantly feel better and get them curious. The next thing I find helpful is to teach them some anatomy, like teach, instead of just tell them what to do, kind of teach them about why that's better, why that, why they might want to do that for their purposes. And your course taught me even more about the things that I, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in how things work now because it, even though my students might not to need to know exactly, you know, as much as I do about it, it helps me observe and become a better teacher. But I do think that even with any student, they need to know a little bit more about their bodies and like you say, how their bodies function. So um, tell me about uh, 
uh, talk about the need to kind of balance imagery, like the rod between your your ears, you know, you nod over, and anatomy and how they kind of go together when you're teaching. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll preface all this by saying that it's remarkable to me to reflect on the fact that human beings, all of us, there are no exceptions. We live in what is probably the most sophisticated and complex living organism that's ever lived on the face of the earth. I mean, that's, that's incredible. And the things we can do with our system, the things we can do with our mind, and the things we can do with our voice, the, the sounds we can make are just far, far and beyond any other creature, although I love all creatures of the earth. But um, what, what we have and what we inhabit is truly remarkable. And so um, I like to point people to that because they often think that they're broken, that there's something wrong with them. But no, we all have this system and it's working for you. And there's incredible kindness in the design of how you're made. And so one of the things we do is uh, anatomy. We, te- we do a specific thing called body mapping, which was developed by a, a woman, um, Barbara Conable and her husband, um, Dale. And uh, I believe that's his name. So, sorry if it's not, um, but you can look it up. And, and they found that people would come to them with a, an innocent misunderstanding of how their body worked. And so they would help update their map and show them, no, actually the arm joint is attached here in the center, not at the shoulder and things like that. And they found when people up, sort of updated their um, idea of how the body worked, that they moved much freer. So but the starting point for me is always the actual truth of the design. Because we, we have this amazing ability to use our imagination, but we, we can also make up a lot of fairy tales about the body. Um, and, and where things are and how they work. A lot of singers, for example, as you know, they have the lungs mapped way down in their belly where there's no lung tissue and, you know, and so- And it, God it's help important. them try to figure out where the diaphragm is. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> it can get a little messy down there, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so just pointing people to the truth. Now, that being said, I've found that having some imagery tools in my toolbox can be extremely effective. For example, one I like to use, a lot of people, they are, they're, they're pushing their shoulder or their arm structure down into their torso. So I'll teach them, well, you have this, this space here, and I'll have them imagine a hot air balloon under each um, shoulder, just sort of kind of r- gently rising, which can help this whole arm structure be suspended, which is what it's naturally designed to do. So yeah. just simple things like that, I think, I think can be helpful. But for me, the starting point is always, what is the actual truth of the design? And then if that's not helpful to the student, let's explore some imagery. Yeah, and I use imagery a lot, but I'm also very cognizant that people can misinterpret it. And that's what the part of the process is fixing something they're thinking too far or they're taking too far. Like pulling can become, you know, instead of just yeah. simple like that. So I use Space Invader coming at you with bad breath. <laughs> and that, that generally makes the move a little bit more natural. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, base, basing it on voice science and on uh, anatomical science and knowing enough. You know, we don't have to know about every little bell and whistle, but uh, knowing enough. And, and I, I really enjoyed what I learned in, that, in the course. Uh, okay, so let's talk about now. And this, this kind of blew my mind. This, I never had thought about this. But talk about the importance of thinking versus feeling as we train our voices to new levels Ooh, this is a juicy one (laughs) well this is kind of a learning edge for me i'm still kind of you know dancing in this playground myself and trying to make new discoveries um one of the fascinating things about how we're designed is we essentially have two nervous systems we have what's called the motor control system and that is when we have an idea of wanting to do something in the the motherboard up here sends a signal to the part of our body that says move. Okay. It's, it's the, and, and the signals, the way the system is designed is what we call yes, go signals. Okay. So yes, go versus no stop. You know, if you ever have driven down a long stretch of a road and you just hit every red light, well, that's kind of what it's like to, to use what we call non-constructive language. Like don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. 
it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not how the system works, okay? So we have the motor control system, but then we also have the sensory system, which is sending information from our periphery, our parts, to the, the motherboard where it's being processed. Now, what's interesting, if you ever touched a hot stove, it's that sensation you get is it, there's a slight delay. Now, it's so small that you don't really sense it, but a feeling is a report of the past. Okay. I, I, th I think of it like when you're driving, it's in something in the rear view mirror. But a lot of people in, in, their, in trying to achieve something through an activity, they're using their feeling as a guide, which is like trying to drive like that, looking backwards. Wow. Yeah. So the, the, what actually is guiding us forward is our thinking. Our thinking in the moment is our best guide. Now, we're going to get feeling information because that's how we're designed. Um, but it, it's really the emphasis in the Alexander technique is not on feeling because a feeling is a report of the past. And I like to say that feelings sometimes show up to work and sometimes they don't, you know, th every day they're different. They're fickle, <laughs> right? They're not the best employees. Um, and it's, and they're also comparative. So I don't know if you've ever done this, you're baking something in your kitchen and you go outside and you come back in and you get a, a sense because it's com they're comparative. They're always comparing what's just happened to what's happening. So feelings are wonderful. We wouldn't be alive without them. And in terms of using the Alexander technique in an activity, they're not the most uh, effective guide for us. Instead, we use what we call constructive thinking. And that is just talking to ourselves in a way of what, what do I want? And what do I, what am I inviting or invoking in my system? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Boy, that has to do with healing in a lot of areas, doesn't it? That would have to do with emotional healing as well. Yeah. Uh, one thing I used to do some volunteer work in a prison called uh, the Better Decisions. And one of the, the first step uh, dealt with uh, know the situation, which was separate the facts from the feelings. Exactly. And uh, so that's, that, I just thought about that. That's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so I love your classes on joint movement. Uh, the, the classes that uh, in that course that were like, like taking balls. I think Darcy may have taught it or, or it might've been uh, the other one. Uh, but, but anyway, that, that they sort of negotiate each other as they move. Yeah. And uh, a great classical teacher, I'm, I've been double teaming, or, du or not double teaming, trading lessons with him. His name is Mark Tress here in Nashville. And I decided I wanted to want to take more classical voice lessons because I'm interested in it. And it saved my life back when, and it just feels good. The vibrations feel good. And he needed to take some contemporary voice uh, lessons to learn, you know, to teach that better. Uh, because his for his uh, his training is in classical, so we got together and we we got together. One, we're just going to get together once, while we get together every Friday and, and trade lessons and trade information. It's it's been fascinating. But but about this uh, thing about um, joints, uh, he one of his teachers is someone I learned to highly respect from reading the Nat's Journal, uh, named Scott Dr. Scott McCoy, and he said Dr. S Dr. McCoy would put him on a Bosu ball and have him sing on a BOSU ball, which you can't just stand on it. <laughs> you have to move. And so he, we, we, I have a, didn't have one, but I had a trampoline. So he had me press into the trampoline with my feet like that. Mm. And oh my gosh, I didn't, I, I mean, I know better. I couldn't believe how it was holding my breath and holding myself and not move. But that released, that release of the joints released some tension that I had to, that was, I was bringing to their, to the to the classical exercise is that the same does that sound does that does that uh sound like the same sort of thing that that you apply yeah i think it's similar and we do several things just to to remind people of how how they're built how they're made um i'll point to one particular joint that i found find this fascinating and that's the the hip joint the ball and socket joint so it's essentially um uh, you know, catcher's glove and a, and a baseball. That's kind of the design. And, and so we have all of these availabilities of movement within that joint. Now, a lot of people conceive of it as just a hinge that they can really want to do this. So again, it goes back to people's conception. And one of the ways you can change 
conception is changing people's perception. So like you said, having them sit on a, a ball. Um, I'll show you one of the tools, actually, I've been using it while, um, while, while talking to you. It's called uh, a balance pad and it's, oh, cool. uh -huh. and it's made by, by Eric's. And I'll often um, have, I'll do it myself and have singers stand on it because what it teaches you is that there's always co consistent and constant movement happening in your system. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Always. You're never, yeah. you're never fixed. You're never still. I like to say that there can be stillness in the movement and movement in the stillness. So even though I'm just standing here relatively still, there's so much movement. I, I think of it like, I like to think of electricity in my joints. Yeah. That at any moment I could go anywhere instead of being fixed in one position. Right. And, and I would imagine uh, from my experience, choir singers have the most trouble with that or people that are doing formal singing because they're supposed to be still the smarter choir directors and the most more the more beautiful choirs i've heard you can see them moving a little bit and i use andre bocelli for an example like uh you know you think he's just standing there you know look at him really close he's moving you can even see his eye sockets moving uh you know his, his, the tissue around his eye sockets moving uh and you have to singing is about uh you know, life, you have to be alive and alive, alive is always moving. And that's another thing you reinforced in your course. And I really, really appreciate it. Uh, let's go on to talking about hands. Uh, I love the way you talk about the voice being uh, helped by a, a kind of a community. And I find community so important. With that community, who are we singing to anyway? It's got to be somebody else, even if it's schizophrenically ourselves. <laughs> but, uh, and you mentioned something, I love this, about community being like extra Alexander Technique hands. And mm -hmm. I teach, I teach using, if without using my hands, I can't sing. Uh, and I'm not even Italian. But uh, talk about a little bit about what Alexander Technique hands, which in, in your case, I think, would mean the teacher's hands. Yeah, I love this topic. And again, this is this is ever evolving for me. My understanding of using we call it touch communication. Um, and and Alexander himself um, developed this. And I think it's it's an incredible um, way of communicating information from human to human. Um, what happened was he made these discoveries on his own without the touch of another teacher. And I, I really like to point people to, to that because um, a lot of people equate Alexander with only hands-on, like if there's no hands-on, there's no Alexander learning happening. But he figured everything out himself without the help of a teacher, just using his thinking and his process. But when he went to teach, he found that words can be tricky. And when he would guide someone verbally that they might misunderstand it. And so as far as I understand, it was almost out of frustration that he, st he said, no, like this, move <laughs> up like this. And then he started wow. using his hands. Um, but there have been many teachers throughout the years, including um, Alexander's brother, who didn't use hands much at all and got, and got very effective results. The way I like to think of hands recently is very informed by one of my favorite teachers, Kathy Madden. She's a master teacher of this work. And she says, our hands are, the Alexander teacher's hands are there to help the student stay with, um, as a yes to the new idea, just a little bit longer than they might themselves. Hold it, hold on to it just a little bit longer, yeah. Just, like, like, I'm just gonna, my hands are just gonna help you stay with that upward motion that your body naturally wants to do so you don't go back into your habit of pulling back and down. Yeah. And yeah. that's how we use their, uh, that's how I've been using my hands. Now, the relationship to community is that it's easy for us to go back into old habits and a community can help us stay as a yes to the new idea longer than we might normally ourselves. That's the power I think of community is they help us realize our, our true self, our true potential. So we don't go back into those familiar ways of doing things. Yeah, we might, I've had students that didn't even, didn't even they would, they would instantly get something and feel better but then they wouldn't trust themselves to hold on to it. And uh, so I think some things that I've learned from you 
would help me with those students. Uh, that particular one I'm thinking of. Uh, okay, let's talk about difficulty, difficult vocal issues. What is the most difficult dish, uh, issue that you've ever seen so far that you've that you've had to work with, and uh, what did you find that helped? So. I have not worked with students that have come in with, you know, major serious vocal issues. Um, so I can't, I can't think of a specific instant like this was the most difficult or challenging voice issue that I've ever encountered. If, if someone did come to me and, and there was some, you know, obviously major concerns with their voice, I would be more comfortable guiding them to a voice professional. Yes, and, me too. Yeah. yeah. Now, people do come in and voice. they don't have, yeah, yeah. And they come in and they don't have the range that they want or they're tight on certain notes. Okay. Well, there's probably not a pathology or something going on, but they are just interfering with their, the natural design of their system. Mm -hmm. So the cool thing I think about what Alexander discovers, discovered is that he, indirectly solved his vocal problem. He didn't go in there and start to mess with his larynx and all of this, this stuff. And I'm not saying that's, that's bad. I, I think technique is absolutely essential and we need to learn how to do, we need vocal skills. But what he discovered was that it was his habit ultimately of pulling his head back and down, gasping for air, depressing his larynx, and grabbing the floor with his feet mm -hmm. that was the problem now he he found that he didn't have a lot of control over his feet or his larynx or his breathing so much but he did have control over this primary relationship of the head and the spine and that as he invited his head to move and his whole body to follow that the breathing took care of itself his feet relaxed and his breathing improved and his voice problem went away yeah I love what you said about happy feet, happy, happy voice. Uh, I used to love to sing barefoot. And I mean, every chance I get, I'd take my shoes off when I would sing. And I never knew why, but now I feel actually pretty good about it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, leading with the head, that's too cool. Uh, well, what in, in, in the 20 years of, of training that I've done, I, I have worked with this serious vocal damage, like, like inoperable polyps and things like that. And FYI, what you do to release that tension, what, what we can do, and that's why I love, I love your course, it's helping me do it even better. But what, what we do, to, you do to, keep, to get the pressure off and get the musculature, you know, the, the instrument uh, working more efficiently and, more, and coordinating it with itself and with the rest of our bodies more efficiently, the body heals itself. And, and the polyps, the inoperable polyps have disappeared uh, spasmodic dysphonia has at least momentarily the symptoms have gone away uh, paralysis as well so the the you know Alexander technique that's why I'm so interested in it because it is a method of taking that tension out and letting the instrument sort of reset itself would you agree absolutely yeah and and I I think of the work that we do in TVF as a subtraction technique not an addition technique we are removing interfering factors so that nature can have its way with us <laughs> yeah, yeah. and that's nature we are <laughs> nature is so much smarter than we are <laughs> there's a there's a book out there that's that says your brain is an idiot but but nature is infinitely genius and so if we can just like you said harness the innate intelligence that we all have in our system we're going to be a whole lot better off yeah yes I agreed, agreed, agreed. Well, uh, Peter, I, I have so many uh, ways to give you feedback on your on your course that I took that uh, edify your course and and in the way that it magnifies what I can do. And I can't. I, we don't have time for me to go into it all. But what I will tell any teacher out there is uh, that they should look you up and look your courses up. And, uh, and, and I encourage people to take some Alexander Technique training, and yours is, is exceptional. So uh, light bulbs were going off the whole time. And at first I was thinking it was going to be so slow. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, and I, I, well, thank you for that. And I want to acknowledge uh, the TVF faculty who co-taught that course with me, um, Michael Hanko, Eleni Vazniadu, Molly Kittle, and Darcy Balcom. Uh, they're just incredible people to work with and to learn from. And um, I want to offer to you, we'll, we'll create a special deal for your listeners and your watchers. Awesome. We'll, um, maybe if we do, we'll, we'll have the, I'll create a link that says totalvocalfreedom.com forward slash ATV, and then right. it will guide them to a special offer. Great, great. Thank you very much. And where can we find you in general? Totalvocalfreedom.com. And uh, yeah, and we got a lot of resources. We've got a blog that has some great stuff. Uh, I love that you're doing a podcast. It's a medium that we want to explore eventually. Um, and we do, like I said, online courses and, and live events, programs right. throughout the year. Right. And the, the online courses are so cool because Alexander Tech, Unique uh, can be expensive, and pe there are some people. There are a lot of people who can't really can't afford it, but really, really right. need it. And so you're making that. That's what I try to do too with some uh, with my blog and and th like this. Give people real information that's actionable, that is something that they can afford. And uh, the online courses that you give are, are very, very, uh, ex you know, affordable if if people really want to take this. So. Anyway, thank you, Peter. It's been such a joy to have you on All Things Vocal. Thank you, Judy. This has been my pleasure. And may I offer a few parting words for your yes, listeners? Please, please, that would be awesome. I just, um, I just encourage you all just to come back to the beauty and brilliance of how you're made. That we are all so, made so beautifully and so perfectly. And if you can really appreciate that, and know that everything in your system, your body, your mind, your voice is working for you, not against you, even though it doesn't often seem like that, that you can really see the kindness. And, and that's what I would encourage you to be to yourself is to, kind, to be kind. And the system responds to kindness because it's made of kindness. So um, thank you all so much for listening and thank you, Judy. Yes, thank you, Peter.